Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, this beautiful book of Psalms. We're going to pick it up today, Psalm 74, verse 7. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We would love to have you. Uh, the Lord would love for you to pick up your Bible and study the letter He wrote to you as well. Psalm 74, uh, the enemy in the sanctuary. Uh, we covered that beautiful Psalm 73 in our last lecture, uh, which is where uh, the psalmist was outside the sanctuary and trying to make up his, his or her mind as to whether uh, it would be better to go into the sanctuary or stay out of the sanctuary. It was kind of a riddle to the psalmist, but uh, finally uh, the psalmist went into the sanctuary uh, and understood uh, that it was far better to go be in the sanctuary uh, because that brings eternal life. Uh, being outside of God's sanctuary uh, brings ruin and destruction. Psalm 74, again, a maskal, that's instruction or understanding of Asaph concerning the enemy in the sanctuary. Let's, uh, uh, and as we ended our last lecture in verse 5 and 6, we learned that you know, it used to be that we looked up to people who used their acts uh, to build up the sanctuary, to build up the church, the many-membered body, if you will. Now, uh, it's people are breaking down the carved work thereof, meaning of the sanctuary, with axes and hammers, tearing down uh, the many-membered body rather than building it up. With that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears today concerning the enemy in the sanctuary. Verse 7, and it reads, They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. Those of you with a reference Bible, you may have that this could also be translated, uh, They have cast your sanctuary into the fire. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. Uh, dwelling place here in the Hebrew, Mishkan. It's from the prime, Shakan, from which comes a word many of you are familiar with, Shekinah glory. Shekinah meaning Yah has dwelt. The name, thy name to the ground, thy dwelling place. And this, the sanctuary here could be any church anywhere in the world. But when God returns to earth and his, his, uh, the eternity, his throne is set up here in the eternity, it will be on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And always keep an eye. And, and we're watchmen. We should uh, be watching. And always keep an eye on Jerusalem and, and what's going on there, not only today, but uh, keep your eye there on events that happen in the future. Verse 8, they, referring to the enemy, said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. Let us destroy all of them at once. The them are God's children. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land, and a, a church of God in the Hebrew, uh, Beth El, house of God. But without God in the church, it's Beth Avin in the Hebrew language, meaning the house of nothing. Now, don't overlook this verse. They said, the enemy said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. Let me tell you something, beloved. Anyone who wants to destroy you, there is no negotiating with them. There, there, there's no talking with someone who wants to wipe you off the face of the earth. And don't ever forget that. Uh, 
um, you know, there's a time and a place for diplomacy. Diplomacy is good when it, when it saves uh, especially lives, innocent lives in many cases. Diplomacy is good, but, but negotiating with someone who their ultimate goal is to kill you makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, don't ever allow yourself to be thrown into that situation. Verse 9, it's a waste of time negotiating with those who want to kill you, in other words. Verse 9, we, or the enemy, they say, we, we see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. And they're too busy looking at their own signs that they established in verse 4 to see the signs of God. And they wouldn't know a prophet if one came up and bit them, although we don't have any prophets today other than the ones God gave us in His Word. But I couldn't help but think about Isaiah uh, chapter 29, verse 10, where God says about the enemy, I'll put a, a stupor over you, a slumber, a spirit of slumber. And, and it'll be to where they bring the vision, or that, that word in, in, in Isaiah chapter 29 verse 11 is revelation in the Hebrew language. And they bring the book to someone who is supposedly learned. And they say, please read this. But they say, I can't for it is sealed. How many of you have been told the book of Revelation you're not supposed to understand it. It's sealed. It's ridiculous. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you shouldn't understand part of God's Word. That Isaiah 29 goes on to say that, you know, your wise men, I'm going to cause their wisdom to cease. And you'll begin teaching the reverence of God by the precept of men. In other words, by the traditions of men and that you draw nigh to me with your mouth, with your lips, your words, in other words, but your heart is far, far from me. Verse 10, O God, the psalmist says, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? And this word reproach means to blaspheme or defy. And I can tell you how long Satan is going to blaspheme God until the last verse of Revelation chapter 20 comes to pass. That's when Satan goes into the lake of fire. But he, he, he will blaspheme God up to that point. And you know, we get letters from, I, I, I shouldn't call them that, but I do, bleeding heart Christians that they think everyone should be saved. And you know, that is God's will. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he's long-suffering, he's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But do you think Satan is ever going to change? Of course Satan is not going to change, and God knows it. That's why Satan has already been sentenced to death, and he's not going to repent. He's not going to change, therefore he will go into the lake of fire. I, for one, look forward to that day. I'm sick and tired of what he does to uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are lost in this world of darkness. Verse 20, Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. Here the, the psalmist uh, asking the Lord how long are you going to listen to all this blasphemy of the enemy from the sanctuary? And when we get to uh, Psalm 74, we'll see that uh, there comes a day when the Lord will not have his hand uh, resting on his bosom. Uh, there is a day coming when judgment will happen. <clears throat> In verses 12 through 17, we hear the, the psalmist uh, turn and pleading and asking uh, based asking for deliverance based on former deliverances. One of Asaph's 
uh, well-known traits in his writings is calling upon the former deliverances of Israel. Verse 12, for God is my king of old. He was my king, capital K, notice, in the first earth age. He is in my second, in the second earth age. This one, he will be in the third future, working salvation or deliverances in the midst of the earth. He's the same yesterday, uh, today, and he will be tomorrow. Verse 13, thou, referring to God, didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. The dragons here, uh, symbolic of, of not only Satan, that's one of his names, Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, that old dragon, but also the Egyptians in the waters here, uh, referring to uh, in Satan's case, the flood of his lies. Uh, in the case of the Egyptians, uh, the Nile. And of course, the first phrase here did divide the sea. When did that happen? Well, when, when Moses was leading Israel out of bondage to the Egyptians. And when they got to the Red Sea, the uh, armies of Pharaoh were hot on their trail. And the, what did God do? He parted the Red Sea so that the people, the children of Israel, could cross over on dry land. Then the waters came crashing back down in on the armies of Pharaoh. Verse 14, thou, and this is emphatic in the Hebrew language, breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. And Leviathan, symbolic of Satan as well. Verse 15, thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. In other words, he, when the people of Israel needed water in the desert and there was no water, on two occasions God uh, parted the rock and water flowed out of the rock. Uh, providing water, needed water to the people of Israel. Thou driest up the mighty rivers, this referring back to uh, when Israel was finally ready to uh, enter the promised land. That generation who was sentenced to die in the wilderness passed away. Only Caleb and Joshua left as uh, they began to cross the Jordan River and this is written of in Joshua chapter 3, verse 17, that as soon as the priests who were bearing the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their feet hit the Jordan, a wall went up. And, and the people of Israel, all it was flood season as well. And the children of Israel crossed over Jordan on dry land. God has done much for his children, and the psalmist pointing out, uh, past deliverances in hope of current deliverance. Verse 16, the day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Here the psalmist is saying not only has God, you know, you think what God did for the children of Israel bringing parting the Red Sea was something or holding back the Jordan while they crossed into the promised land was something. That really was nothing for our Heavenly Father. He that created the day and the night and prepared the light and the sun. Awesome power. And he's humbling himself here before the Creator as well. Uh, again, seeking and petitioning for uh, current deliverance, verse 17. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. This is talking about the separation between the oceans and the seas and dry land, the coastlines, if you will, uh, God established. Can you imagine the power that that required? You know, the power of the oceans and the seas and, and he contains them and separates them from the dry land. That's awesome. Thou hast made summer and winter. He's 
here personifying the seasons and uh, there always will be a summer and a winter as it's written in the book of Genesis. Now verses 18 through 23 uh, we have a prayer of Asaph for deliverance. Verse 18, remember this that the enemy hath reproached O Lord and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name and over and over and over his name is blaspheme. Reproach again means to blaspheme or or to scoff at. And, and you hear it yourself, you know, you, if you try to talk to someone about uh, Jesus and witness to them and they scoff at you and they don't have time for you, they don't have time for God. Well, uh, there will come a time that uh, they will be, there will be a judgment coming as we'll see when we get to Psalm 75. Verse 19, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. The poor are those who are humble uh, before God. A turtle dove you could think of as uh, what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying, comparing Israel uh, to a turtle dove. In other words, uh, don't turn your beloved, meaning Israel, uh, into the hands of the multitude of the wicked. And the psalmist here, go back to verse 1 and 2, he started off, you know, really, O oh God, why hast thou cast us off forever? And, and that's the way the psalmist is feeling, like God has forgotten them. But God didn't forget them, they forgot God. And uh, the only time he hears from uh, some of his children is when they're in trouble and then they come running back to him, but they don't have time for him when things are going well. Verse 20, have respect unto the covenant for the dark places of the earth are full, full excuse me, of the habitations of cruelty. Don't give in, beloved. Take, take names and kick dragon. You know, that's what, uh, and what, by that I'm talking about uh, encourage God's children to get into the sanctuary. Don't put up with the enemy in the sanctuary, which is what this particular psalm is about. Violence, unjust gain, deception, vice, all of these things are part of the wicked. And uh, when they're in the sanctuary, it prohibits God's children from doing what they should do in the sanctuary. So don't give in, teach uh, truth. And if, you, if you're not a teacher, uh, support a ministry that teaches truth uh, so that we can keep the enemy out of the sanctuary. There comes a point in time though, and, and let me speak on that just a moment, where the enemy most certainly is going to be in the sanctuary. It's the day of Jacob's trouble. You've heard me refer to that many times as we work our way through the Psalms. Uh, the enemy that's going to be in the sanctuary at that point in time, Antichrist. He's going to be here on earth. It's written in Isaiah chapter 14 uh, where his name is Lucifer, that he's going to establish his throne on the north side of Jerusalem. You see, that's God's place. That's where God will establish his throne, but uh, Satan will be there claiming to be God. There's never a time that we'll have a bigger enemy in the sanctuary. And many of you, God's election, have a destiny. Uh, you will be delivered up to witness against him. That's when the Holy Spirit will speak through you in that cloven tongue and the enemy is not going to be in the sanctuary, sanctuary forever because God said, you know, I'm not going to cleanse it again, but one time. And you know when that one time that he cleanses it? It's really going to need it after that. It's going to be after the Antichrist has been here uh, in, in, in the person, in the juror, if you will. 21, O oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. 
let the poor and needy praise thy name. And uh, they better. Uh, and thank him for the many blessings that he bestows upon us as well. But the humble will be exalted. Jesus made that clear in the New Testament. But the arrogant and those who are haughty and off on an ego trip such as Satan himself will be brought low. 22, arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man, this is Nabal in the Hebrew, the foolish man is the stupid man, reproacheth thee daily. It never ceases. Uh, they scoff at the Lord. Uh, but there comes a time that uh, there will be judgment, we'll see when we get to Psalm 75, 23. Forget not the voice of thine enemies, the, the blasphemy of their words, the scoffing of their words, the tumult or the uproar of those that rise up against thee increaseth continually. This word is uh, ascendeth uh, continually. And the sanctuary will be cleansed, but the uproar of those that rise up against God, it's going to get worse. That's what this is saying. It will increase every day. It's not going to get any better until the Lord returns and takes care of business. Just plan on it. That's, that's written. It is going to happen. We have a subscription to Psalm 74. Those of you with companion Bibles, you'll find this at the end of Psalm 74. Uh, the remainder of you will find it at the beginning of Psalm 75. It belongs to 74 because of the subject. To the chief musician, Altus Keith. Uh, to the chief musician, to he who has the victory, to he who gives the victory, referring to Christ, of course. Altus Keith means destroy not. And the appeal is suited uh, to the day of Jacob's trouble uh, when the enemy will be in the sanctuary. Destroy not. Psalm 75 uh, a psalm of, or song of Asaph again. Uh, 75, our subject is going to be enemies of the sanctuary warned, and God's people are encouraged because the enemy is about to be judged, uh, or the nearness of the judge with the cup of wrath that will be poured out on the enemies of God. This will find the answer to Psalm 74, the prayer in verse 22, asking, Arise, God, plead thine own cause. Uh, he's not going to wait forever to arise and plead his own cause. Psalm 75, verse 1. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, twice for emphasis for that thy name is near thy wondrous works declare. Men tell of thy wondrous works. And, and you know, his works are wonderful. And when that judgment comes about, the righteous are going to be encouraged and happy because that's when the enemy is going to be corrected or destroyed. That's, it's their choice as it is our choice today. You can do things God's way and receive his blessings or don't do things his way and receive his cursings. Uh, in the latter end, you can choose to go into the eternity or you can choose to go into the lake of fire. The choice is yours. Verse 2, when I shall receive the congregation I will judge uprightly. Now these, this is the Lord speaking. And that judgment day comes. And, uh, you know, it's written in the book of Galatians chapter 6 that God will not be mocked that you reap what you sow. And that judgment day uh, comes. Now many shake in their boots when they hear of judgment. But, you know, there's no need to fear judgment day if you love and serve the Lord. It's a day of rewards for those who love and serve Him. 
and this too doesn't carry over in the English, but it means that the set time has come. When he says, I will judge uprightly, he's saying at the set time. What time is that? Verse 3. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. That sets the time. When are all the inhabitants of the earth dissolved? You can read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses. When that last trump, the seventh trump, sounds, uh, we step out of these flesh bodies into our spiritual bodies. Uh, pretty graphically stated in Zechariah chapter 14, where it talks about our eyeballs dissolving out of their sockets. Also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, we learn that at that time that all the elements, the evil rudiments, if you will, will melt with fervent heat because our Father is a consuming fire. I bear up the pillars, or I hold up the pillars of it, sila. More on the pillars as we get to the uh, last portion of this particular psalm. Uh, many of you have a destiny to serve as a pillar uh, in the temple of God. The sila here, uh, stop, pause, meditate, and it's connecting uh, the set time that we've been talking about of judgment with the judgment itself as it will affect the wicked and the righteous. And say that one more time. The set time of judgment uh, with the judgment itself as it will affect the wicked and the righteous. Again, uh, the choice is yours. The, the judgment can be a good thing if you are righteous, if you try and do what's right. Now, I don't want anybody to get off on a, a guilt trip. Nobody's perfect. We all fall short. But that's the beauty of Christianity. We have repentance. So, uh, But if you are righteous, judgment will be a good thing, a good day. If you're wicked, uh, well, it's not going to be such a pleasant day. Verse 4, I said unto the fools, uh, you, you mean God thinks of some of his children as fools? Uh, that's what he said. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, rasha in the Hebrew can be even the wicked one, Satan, lift up, uh, the, lift not up thy horn. In the book of Daniel chapter 7 and 8, there's a horn uh, there that is called the little horn. If you're not familiar, that's one of the names of the Antichrist. But he will lift up his own horn and, and the horn also symbolic of power as he stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God. Verse 5, lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. A stiff neck is a, uh, a stubborn neck or, or someone who is arrogant, if you will. And I can tell you one who will uh, speak with a stiff neck and it will be in his pride claiming that he is above all including God. Verse 6, For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Now, which direction was left out of that? And some uh, higher critics would say, well, the north is missing from that, and it's talking about uh, Syria, that, that, that the people of Israel will look to the north, to Syria, to deliver them and for judgment. Not the case, beloved. North is left out. I mentioned earlier Isaiah 14 on the north side of Jerusalem. Will God's throne be uh, established? And that is where judgment and justice will come from on the north side of Zion, verse 7. But, uh, or rather, but God is the judge, or no, God is the judge, not, not uh, the Syrian to the north. He putteth down one and setteth up another. And 
uh, when God comes onto the scene, uh, he's going to set one down, all right, and put him down. Uh, he's going into the abyss for the thousand years. His name is Satan. He's also going to uh, set up another as he sets up Christ as King of Kings, Lord of Lords at that seventh trump. The rest of us, it will be judgment according to our works as it's uh, written in Revelation chapter 20 uh, verses uh, 4 and the following verses. Some uh, partake in the first resurrection. Uh, those who love and serve him, his election, uh, the second death hath no power over them. Others have to wait until the end of the white throne judgment at the end of the millennium and then they also are judged upon their works. Verse 8, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Oh boy, you mean the Lord is going to serve refreshments. This is one cup you do not want to partake of, beloved. And the wine is red. It is full of mixture. And he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. This is the cup of God's wrath. And it's not going to be a leisurely sip of a cup that you might consider like when you have a glass of wine yourself. It's going to be poured out all at one time. And, and the wicked get what they have coming all at one time. I look forward to that day as well. This is written of in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 14 verses 9 and 10. And uh, who is it that drinks the dregs of this cup? It's those who worship the beast. Uh, the mark, take the mark of the beast is what that's talking about. Verse 9, but I will declare forever, <clears throat> I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. When you see Jacob, we're talking about all 12 of the natural seed line, the 12 sons of Jacob. Verse 10 to conclude, all the horns of the wicked, all the power of the wicked, if you will. Also will I cut off the Lord speaking. He is going to take care of business. The wicked will get what they have coming. They don't get ahead. They don't prosper. But the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And the horns of the righteous will be exalted because they're humble. And if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. If you exalt yourself, prepare to be abased, the teachings of Jesus Christ. I mentioned earlier the pillars in the temple. Make a note of Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, where Jesus says, I will make the overcomers pillars in the temple. And you know what the temple is in the millennial age? It's the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb There is also the, the temple of the millennial age. What an honor to, to serve as a pillar in the very temple that is God and Jesus Christ. Uh, and you know, with the conclusion of Psalm 75, I want to congratulate all of you. Uh, normally I wouldn't congratulate you on uh, the completing of a half a book of the Bible, but in the case of Psalms with 150 Psalms, we just concluded Psalm 75. We just made it halfway through. So congratulations. I hope you're enjoying the Psalms as much as I am preparing them and bringing to you. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. 
A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization. By name, we teach God's Word in a positive format. Uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you. I encourage you to go to Him often, at least once a day. Make time to talk to your Father. And, and you should be able to talk to Him just like you would talk to your flesh Father. That's, your relationship should be that close, that tight is how you should uh, talk with your Heavenly Father. When you got major decisions in your life, it doesn't hurt to throw out a fleece and to ask His counsel there is no better counsel, beloved. We do have these prayer requests. Father, we come united as one in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Father, we ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, uh, addictions to alcohol, drugs, Father, uh, problem marriages. You know their needs, Father. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We remember our military troops and lift them up in prayer who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, protect, and heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. And we had Frank in New York, and Frank had two questions. We got the first one answered at the end of our last lesson. Uh, we're going to cover his second. I heard you mention, per your Psalms teaching, that Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon and Nathan. But after my review, especially between 2 Chronicles 4.14 through Ezra, I can't seem to find your statement. Well, you went too far. Go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5, and you will find that Bathshua, as it's listed in the King James Version Bible, but I hope you have a strong, Frank. Check it out. You'll find out that Bathshua is the same as Bathsheba, and she certainly was a wife to David, and she was the mother of Solomon and Nathan. Also, I thought Jesus' carnal mother, that would be Mary, just like her cousin Elizabeth was from the tribe of Levi. So, is it appropriate to say that King David's son, Nathan's mother, was also from the tribe of Levi, which we know that Solomon's mother wasn't. And this is where I'm stuck pondering. That's because you don't realize who uh, Solomon and Nathan's mother was. It was Bathsheba. But uh, make a note, Luke chapter 3, verse 23, you're half right concerning Mary. Uh, she was of the tribe of Levi. That can be documented in Luke chapter 1 because her cousin Elizabeth was of the daughters of Aaron. Therefore, uh, Mary's mother and Elizabeth's mother uh, was one and the same, and they were, they, they were both of the daughters of Aaron. I'm getting that turned around there. Uh, they're both half of Levi, if you will, or Mary was, because they, she was a cousin to Elizabeth is what I'm trying to get to. The other point I want to make, Luke chapter 3, verse 23, where we learn that Mary's father's name was Heli. And people often get confused because it's 
called Joseph's family by, uh, by in-laws, if you will, and, and that's what it's talking about is in-laws, but Heli was the father of Mary. He was of the tribe of Judah. So in Christ, you have the, uh, the king line, Judah, and the priest line, Levi, uh, in one package. Richard in North Dakota. You have stated that the unpardonable sin is to not let the Holy Spirit speak through you, documented in Mark 13. I understand and agree with that, but in Romans 8, 9, and 11, we have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and so if we reject the Holy Spirit's call to accept Christ, we are condemned because without Christ we are lost. Well, I tend to agree with you, Richard, somewhat, but let me ask you, if someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit and they haven't invited Christ into their heart and then they do accept Christ as their Savior and invite Him into their heart and the Holy Spirit, is, that, is He then unforgivable? Of course not. And then, he, if he repents, he can be forgiven. So, when unpardonable, when we use that term, we mean uh, that's a situation that can't change. And uh, someone not having the Holy Spirit in them and Christ in them is not an unchangeable situation. That is why we work so hard to convert our brothers and sisters who are lost. Pat in Wisconsin, when the four men were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and one man put his hand out to stop the Ark from falling and God struck him dead, doesn't it seem that the rest of the story is missing? Well, Pat, you're a little bit off on your rendition of the story too. I know you're talking about First Chronicles uh, chapter 13, verse 6 in the following verses. And what was happening there, they were bringing David and Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Covenant of God from kerjath Jerem to Jerusalem, or trying to. Uh, what happened? Well, it wasn't priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as you stated, as, as what it should have been the method of transporting the Ark of the Covenant, and by Kohathites only, uh, what did they do? They put the Ark of the Covenant on an ox-drawn cart, which is the way the Philistines, the heathen, returned the Ark of God to Israel. And uh, the holiness of God is unapproachable by man. And God made it very clear uh, in Numbers chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. You, you do things per my instructions concerning the temple and the sanctuary uh, or suffer death. And uh, that was the uh, punishment that's called uh, the uh, Peretz Uzzah, which means the breach of Uzzah. And, you know, David and, and, and the rest of Israel, they were baffled by that event. Kind of like evidently you were baffled by this event. They didn't know what they had done wrong. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant to the house of Obed-Edom and left it there for 90 days, three months. And they went back and they pulled out uh, the Torah and they did a little reading in the book of Numbers, what's the proper way to prepare the Ark of the Covenant to be moved? What's the proper way to uh, transport the Ark of the Covenant? And they went back to plan A and, and redid their homework and then they were successful in bringing up the ark uh, to Jerusalem on the second attempt. Ron in Louisiana, I am a Christian and my only job is working at a casino. Should I not be working there? I know of no reason that a Christian uh, shouldn't work at a casino as long as you're not doing anything illegal or anything else, uh, uh, making an honest living. Nothing wrong with working in a casino. Casinos employ a lot of people. There would be a lot of people without work if it weren't for the casinos. You may or may not agree with uh, what casinos do, but that's, that's up to you. Leon in Mississippi, where in the Bible can I find 
the scripture take it as often for remembrance of the Lord, the Lord's Supper you have in parentheses. Uh, Luke chapter 22 verse 19 in the following verses is one of the places where you'll find where Christ said, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now as far as take it as often uh, for the remembrance, I think what you've heard us say is here that you you can take communion as often as you feel the need to take it, as, long, as often as you want to remember uh, what Christ did. Uh, we try not to take uh, communion every time we meet so that it doesn't become uh, a ritual, if you will, and, and the special significance of taking the Lord's Supper uh, somewhat diminished by it becoming a repetitive uh, ritual. Dave in Montana, if a child is murdered in his mother's womb by abortion, does that soul have to go into another womb to still be born in the flesh or just go back to the Lord's arms in paradise? Back to the Lord's arms in paradise. Uh, miscarriage, uh, infants, aborted uh, embryos um, have served in the flesh. Uh, it's that the soul goes into the embryo at conception. And uh, I think some souls are just too good, uh, according to our Heavenly Father, to put them through life in the flesh on earth. And he does take them back uh, to his bosom. Jason in Virginia, where in the Bible can I find the first earth age? It says in the children of God played had it made until Satan failed. I don't know what your last phrase there is. I'm, I'm thinking Job uh, chapter 1 where the children of, of God were uh, with uh, our Heavenly Father and Satan came walking up to them, I think is what you're talking about there. But the first earth age, uh, in my opinion, one of the best uh, scriptures that you can read about the first earth age you'll find in Second Peter uh, chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. You know, that's a critical study and you might, uh, Jason and anyone else who doesn't understand the three world ages, it's critical for you to, to get a handle and understand that because there's no way you're going to understand, as Paul put it, the mysteries of God unless you have a handle on the three world ages. Uh, so much of God's Word won't come together for you unless you understand that. And uh, that's one of our recommended studies for new students. On page three of every newsletter that we mail out each month, you'll find a list of suggested studies on CD or cassette tape for new students. And Three World Ages is one of those. It's kind of like algebra. You, you have to get the basic building blocks down before you can go on and build up from there. And, and those studies listed on page three of the newsletter, uh, Pastor Arnold Murray put together is these are important for you to get down uh, to have as the basics, but then you can go from there in your studies of God's Word. Paul in Mississippi, I'm no fool for due to such pain and misery, I have to take strong medication, doctor's prescription, which gets me through the day. I hate the dependence upon these drugs and I feel such guilt. Though I try and try, I am unable to live in constant pain and I have to take the medication. Am I a sinner concerning this matter? And though I give God the credit for my life and try to plant seeds and tell others about my blessings. Well, good for you. I'm glad that you're able to tell people about their blessings and uh, you should always follow your doctor's orders. If you don't follow your doctor's orders, you need to find another doctor because uh, if you, you've got to have that relationship with your doctor that you follow 
And, and you know, there are certain conditions that require constant pain medication. And if you have one of those, and obviously your doctor thinks that you do, absolutely nothing wrong with you being able to manage the pain uh, through prescription drugs. When you hear us talking about uh, drug dealers and not being in heaven, we're not talking about pharmacists who uh, dispense legal prescription drugs. We're talking about those who uh, dispense illegal drugs and that's what we're talking about when the word in the, the translated into English is sorcery which comes from the Greek word in the New Testament pharmakia which from which comes our word pharmacy but drugs you get at a legal pharmacy uh, are not what it's talking about it's talking about illegal drugs Robert in Tennessee what is hell well Revelation chapter 20 uh, you have the lake of fire, and that is hell. God is a consuming fire, and those who go into the lake of fire, <clears throat> excuse me, such as Satan, uh, will be destroyed. They're gone forever and ever. Those who don't go into the lake of fire, that's when the eternity begins, and the second death, the death of the soul, has no power over those who go into the eternity. Joan in Georgia, I just lost my husband. He was very ill. We're sorry for your loss, Joan. Uh, we'll, we'll have you in our prayer to find comfort. He used to watch your teachings with me, but because of his medication, he could no longer stay awake. Uh, he just passed away this week. Pastor, when I talk to my husband, will he still hear me? And you know, I don't think so. Uh, you know, there, God and those who pass on are in a different dimension than we are in. We, we can't see into that dimension, and unless God wants uh, the person in that dimension to see in this dimension, it's not going to happen. But, you know, life in, in, in the flesh is a brief moment compared to the eternity. And, Joan, I want you... Uh, to you, you know where your husband is. He's with the Father, and he's receiving his just rewards there. I know the Lord has welcomed him and said, "Well done, my good and faithful servant." And uh, yes, there's going to be a period of time of separation. Yes, that is very difficult, but it's a short period of time compared to the eternity. I want you to find comfort in your Father's word, uh, knowing that you will see your husband once again in that spiritual body. Doesn't get old, doesn't get sick. Uh, we look forward to that day. Terry in Colorado, I heard of you speaking about an evil person by the name of Manasseh. Uh, where in the Bible can I find this? And Manasseh was one of the kings of Judah and he was a probably the most notorious uh, evil king of Judah, arguably the most evil. Uh, but you can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 21. Almost his entire reign is covered there in 2 Kings 21. And it states in verse 16 that he shed innocent blood uh, very much in Jerusalem. Uh, he was one of the ones who also uh, offered live uh, sacrifices, human sacrifices, to Molech, some of him, uh, his own children. Mildred in North Carolina, what is alabaster? Is it a type of stone or is it a color of a stone? And in Matthew uh, 26, 7, also Mark 14, 3, you find the word alabaster, and it is the name of a particular stone. Uh, Larry in California, uh, where in the Bible can I find where Jesus came from? Not of Mary, but of God. Well, he was of Mary, uh, not of Joseph. In Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 28 and through, through 32, ought to uh, get said what you're looking for, that, that Jesus uh, was of his mother Mary 
and, and the Holy Spirit visited her and she conceived. He is the only begotten son of our Heavenly Father. Lori in Oklahoma, is it okay to be left-handed or is it a sin? Uh, left-handed is a big uh, false teaching and a misconception, misunderstanding of God's Word. In Judges chapter 3 verse 15, uh, it's talking about Ehud, one of the judges of Israel, and it states that he was left-handed. And it simply means, if you take it back to the Hebrew language, that he was handicapped. He was left-handed because his right hand was closed. In other words, he was crippled uh, in his right hand, and that's what being left-handed meant. Nothing wrong with being left-handed. Uh, who do we have here? Glor Gloria, it looks like, with a C in Connecticut. I believe it's supposed to be, no, I think it is Clovia or Gloria, maybe, I don't know. You know who you are. I heard you say that the Lord's Supper should only be taken three times a year or it becomes a tradition. We answered that question earlier when we were talking about communion. The, the reason we do that is we don't want it to become a, a ritual. In other words, something that's done so often that it loses the uh, significance, if you will, uh, that we like for it to carry. I am out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know what? Your Heavenly Father loves it. When He looks down from heaven and He sees you with the letter that He wrote to you, the Bible open, and you're seeking knowledge of Him, it makes His day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you. Help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. There is one thing that's most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word. You know, every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.